So welcome to the University of Connecticut uh, Brain Imaging Research Center or Burke's speaker series. I'm the host, Fumiko Haft, Director of Burke and Professor of Psychological Sciences, Math, Neuroscience and Psychiatry. Over the past two years, we've hosted a number of speakers, as you can see here, most of whom their recordings are available on our website. We've had about 2,500 people joining our series from over 150 institutions all over the world. Thank you so much for helping us make the series uh, so successful. Please do let your friends and colleagues know about the series and they can give, uh, get updates by emailing Lizzie listed here. Some housekeeping items that I'm sure you know by now, you will be muted. And we usually try unmuting to clap before and after the talk so that we feel like there's an audience. I like it this way, I always fail doing this, but I'm gonna try it again as I always do. If you have questions, please enter it in the chat box and we will take most questions or all questions at the end. So let's get started. Today is my greatest pleasure to, oh, I want to say one more thing. Upcoming speakers, Russ Poldrack, Kalani grill Specter, Mary Lou gornar tempini and so on. So please do stay tuned. All right. So let's get started. Today is my greatest pleasure to introduce our first speaker of 2021, Professor Dean Mobs, a Chen Scholar and Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences and Computational Neurosystems Program from California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California. Prior to his appointment, he was Assistant Professor at Columbia University in the Department of Psychology. And we were just, I was just asking him how he, um, his trick of skipping associate professorship and going straight into professorship. So, um, um, and some of you may have missed this. He started off as a research assistant, or at least I know him through those days at Stanford University in the School of Medicine, Division of Interdisciplinary and Brain Sciences Research. I thought he was crazy back then. I think he is still crazy and uh, in a amazingly great way. And I hate to drop high impact journal names here, but when he was an RA, he published eight uh, papers even before going off to graduate school with four of them being first author and in journals like Neuron and PNAS. So that's why I think he's crazy. Um, he had amazingly great ideas and he was thorough and persistent. He then went on to grad school to study with Chris Frith and Ray Dolan at UCL in 2004, and then in 2008 to do a postdoc at MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at Cambridge University before moving back to the United States. Um, he's originally a Brit, as you will be able to tell from his accent, sense of humor, and how he dresses, even though you might not be able to tell from his black shirt, just the top uh, first ha top half, though he may have changed in the 10 years that I haven't seen him. So Dean is interested in the intersection of behavioral ecology, economics, emotion, and social psychology, and understanding the neural, computational, and behavioral dynamics of human social and emotional experiences. He uses brain imaging, computational modeling and behavioral techniques to probe the neurobiological systems responsible for fear and anxiety. He has over 70 high impact publications in journals such as Science, PNS, Neuron, Nature Neuroscience, Nature Review Neuroscience, Ticks, and so on, and has won numerous awards such as the APS Janet Spencer Spence Award Transformative Early Career Contributions in 2015. With this, please join me in welcoming Professor Dean Mobs. And hang on one second, because I am going to mute everyone. Um, let me see. I am not doing this well today. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you for your patience. I'm going to let me try to unmute everyone here. I am insisting on clapping, so I should unmute everyone shortly. I think we're unmuted. All right, so let's get to clap and welcome the speaker. And thanks, Dean. And I'm going to mute everyone. All right, go ahead, Dean. All right. Do I do I just have to share it again, or? Oh yes, please do share okay. again. All right, there you go. Okay, can you guys see that? Okay. Yes. All right. Let me just hide that floating control panel there. Uh, thanks for that wonderful uh, introduction there for me, for Miko. It was uh, uh, when you invited me, it brought back all the old memories from uh, Stanford. And I see some of my old friends on there just now, like Krista, <laughs> my Krista, uh, some of my uh, friends on, on, the, on the talk today. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to um, talk about today is really um, the, the approaches that we've taken 
uh, in the field of effective neuroscience to really try and uh, dissociate these uh, neural systems in the brain associated with fear and anxiety. Um, before I do that, I would like to um, uh, say thank you um, uh, and acknowledge all of my collaborators over the years uh, for the research that I'll be talking about today. Um, uh, particularly Demis Sabis, who's become quite famous now as the editor of uh, Google DeepMind. We were um, graduate students together in, in London. Um, and my supervisors, uh, Chris Frith, Ray Dolan, and my long-term collaborator, Peter Diane, we're talking about some more theoretical work that me and Peter have put forward more recently. Um, we've also got a few papers that are under revision at the moment that um, I won't be talking about today, but really linking to this idea that the social environment uh, can impact how we perceive fear. Um, my other collaborators here, but I really want to point out um, a, a couple of people here, which is my uh, 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 graduate students postdocs here, um, Song Chi, who's, uh, who followed me from Columbia to Caltech uh, and is now at NIMH doing his postdoc there, and Boeing Fun, um, who also contributed to some of the work uh, in this, in this uh, talk today. And is a, is a picture of us in front of the Beckman at Caltech. Um, I should say that my lab since COVID uh, began, my lab has turned over quite a bit. And actually it's only Tanaz who's in my lab now. So all these people have left my lab. Um, and sadly we can't take any photographs because we've, I've actually not physically not met half of my lab at the moment. We've all done everything over, over um, Zoom um, and so forth in, in the last year. So uh, interesting times, but I'm looking forward to updating this photograph once we get to see each other uh, in, in, in person. And thank all these funded, funded by as well, who funded a lot of the work uh, that I'll be talking about today. Okay, so um, about um, uh, a couple, couple of years ago now, um, I've got this group of individuals together um, in the field of effective neuroscience. And ask these uh, individuals who are perceived to be the, the leaders in the field, it's a very American centric group of individuals. Um, there's a whole group of, of, of people in Europe also doing uh, this similar type work, but um, we sort of focused on the American perspective here. And in this um, uh, viewpoints article, it was a, an article that really tried to probe um, ways in which we're defining fear and investigating it and how we can all come together with our theoretical. Um, approaches to try and uh, create some overlap in the way we interpret our results and theories and so forth. So I recommend those of you interested in effective neuroscience, um, you should read this, this, um, this paper because um, it's not only um, uh, uh, this paper that's in Nature Neuroscience, but they also published it in Scientific American. And then there's an old iceberg of supplementary material going into these questions and arguments between each of these individuals. And sadly, because I was the, um, uh, the um, so the narrator on this in some respects, um, I was unable to really put my own perspective in that. So today you'll get to see some of my own views um, uh, uh, on the topics of, of how we define fear and anxiety. So um, just to give you a bit of a rundown, really sort of four of the dominant theories that are around uh, today in terms of how we perceive um, the brain responds to different levels of threat, danger, and the distinction between fear and anxiety. If we look on the left over here in the blue, we can see Panksepp's theory of these dedicated primal emotions, um, these dedicated circuits in the brain, which you associate with different types of emotions. What we're interested in here today is really just one, which is fear, maybe panic as well. Um, but what um, Yak had argued was that there's these hardwired circuits in the brain of mammals in particular um, that we can uh, map out uh, presumably in humans as well. If we go all the way over to the other side here, we can see the conceptual act theory put forward by Lisa Fairman Barrett, which is almost completely opposite. This is where there's no dedicated circuits in the brain, that fear and the perception at least of, of, of threat is not universal. And what fear is, is the conglomeration of brain regions that combine to create an emotion. And the way that, um, that it's quite a complex uh, idea, but basically the way that uh, Lisa describes this is through analogy that if you have flour and you have water, you have eggs, you have sugar, you have um, salt, what you can do is you can create um, different mixtures um, or different uh, mixtures of these different um, uh, uh, ingredients to create different things like pancakes, bread and so on. Okay, you can tell I'm not a very good cook. <laughs> but it's a good example of basically there's no ad um, wise in the brain. There's just a system that makes 
up the emotions as we go along. It's really based off of, of uh, John Searle's work from the field of, of, uh, of philosophy. In the middle, we have um, Joe Ledoux's two systems model, or the Ledoux and Pine model, that proposes that there's really two circuits that we should be looking at. These defensive survival circuits that map closely to Panksepp's dedicated uh, circuits. And then there's these higher order representations of fear. Okay. Um, and what he argues is, which is the controversial element of, of Joe's uh, theory, is that we cannot study fear in other animals, or we can only study fear in humans. Okay. This is because we, the only way that we can study fear is by asking individuals how they feel, and we can't ask a rodent how it feels, for, uh, which is quite obvious. So what we can do in, 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 in animals is study the defensive survival circuits, their fight, flight, freeze, and type behaviors, for example. Sitting next to this um, is Michael Fanslow's theory of this, um, uh, the relationship between ecology and the spatial temporal um, uh, uh, distance to threat and how that can be used as a way to um, uh, dissociate fear and anxiety and defensive behaviors. And uh, more recently, Michael has put forward this idea of this sort of single um, system model. Um, which again sort of links a little bit, I guess, to um, Lisa Feldman Barrett's model as well. Although I think, don't think Michael would agree with that. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so what um, uh, these four um, theories really represent is where we are in the field at the moment. These are really four of the leaders in in the field of of human effectiveness or an animal effectiveness, I should say. Um, and um, of course, they all disagree with each other. And again, you can go back to that nature neuroscience cycle to see their arguments uh, for and against e each other's theories. But um, today what I'm going to talk about is really a little bit more about some of my theoretical ideas associated with um, what fear and anxiety is. And again, what I think um, this, this theory puts forward in some respects is a sort of mixture of all of these models. Okay, so how do we define fear and anxiety? Well, if we go back to Charles Darwin, Darwin said that fear takes the gradation from attention to extreme terror and awe. And he took very much in this definition, the dimension approaches, which is which we take as well. But if we go to contemporary theorists, um, they propose that fear is the motion that results from a, the presence of an highly imminent or tangible threat, a threat that's here and now, okay? While anxiety is about when, the aversive stimulus is abstract or remote in time or space. So um, to make this a little bit clearer, the way that we think about anxiety is that anxiety is, that, is results from the potential encounter with a future threat. Okay, it's not something that's happening here and now, it's something that we can imagine, use perspective, we can think about the future to think about bad things that might happen to us. Whereas fear is when the threat is here and now, okay? So for example, if I was to put a tiger next to you right now, okay, you would feel fear, okay? This would result in an escape response versus if I was to tell you that when you go shopping today or if you could go outside today, um, then and I, I tell you that there's a potential that you may encounter a tiger on the way to the store, then that would evoke some anxiety in you, okay? So anxiety is about the future, fear is about now. That's the way we, uh, we define it. But we also believe there's a continuum between these two um, emotions. So when I originally um, began to think about these questions, I thought, well, I need to go back to the drawing board. I want to understand the, uh, the adaptive function of fear and anxiety and relate this to survival in the natural world. And this link between evolution, ecology and ethology and uh, human brain imaging is not a crazy idea. It was the Nobel Prize winner, Nico Timberburn, uh, Tim who um, uh, said that it begins to be difficult, even in some cases impossible, to say where ethology stops and neurophysiology begins. And we recently proposed that really to understand our decision processes, we must consider the evolutionary and ecological conditions that give rise to them. Because if we don't do this, this leaves the, the field of effective neuroscience and the study of fear, ungrounded and now to interpret in the natural world. So I want to go then a little bit now into our sort of theoretical background um, to really begin to make sense of the empirical work that I'll be talking about later. 
So uh, in um, uh, a paper published a few years ago now in the journal Current Opinion Behavioral Sciences, a special issue that me and Joe Ledoux uh, put forward. Um, I proposed in my article that first of all, we need to understand these natural conditions, okay, to understand how animals respond to danger in the real world. And this includes the traits of the threat and the uh, temporal and spatial parameters associated with that threat. And once we understand those conditions, we can then begin to study how animals, including humans, um, strategize um, actions and reactions to those natural conditions. And once we understand the behaviors and strategies that the animal will use, um, we can then begin to build much better computational models of how they optimize their, for example, escape and avoidance of threat, and how those um, strategies are, are modulated by other interconnected survival circuits. For example, animals are not always just avoiding threat, but they're, they're following their mating, for example. And we know through a lot of work that when an animal is, for example, thirsty or starving, it will become more risky uh, in, in predator dense environments. So once we understand those strategies and those conditions, we can then begin to have um, a better understanding of how to map out these defensive circuits in the human and the animal brain. So, one model that's been particularly important in my way of thinking is a model put forward by Michael Franz, that I briefly mentioned earlier, called the Threat Imminence Continuum. And this really is, is a model of the different ecological conditions that give rise to different intensities of threat. So there's really four levels within this. There's the preferred activity. Okay, This is the safest place that the, the animal can be. Okay, So if we look at our example here at the top, we can see that there's a bird in its nest. This is the safest place the bird can be. Okay. But if our little bird was to fall to the bed of the forest, it would be in a situation where there's a potential to encounter a threat. And we refer to this as the pre-encounter defensive behavior. This is typically uh, the, the, the uh, environment in which the animal is in when it's foraging, for example. So our little bird falls to the bed of the forest, and this is a situation where it may encounter a threat, maybe from its nest, it looked down, it would see a natural predator, like a cat, for example. Um, and know that this is not really a safe place. But under the pre-encounter defensive uh, condition, we know that at that point in time, there's no actual threat in the environment. The next step is the post-encounter defensive uh, mode. And this uh, condition is where a bird, for example, spots a natural predator in the environment, but there's no direct interaction between the predator and prey here. And finally, our predator, the cat, wakes up and begins to attack our little bird. And this is known as the circus strike defensive mode. So what I wanted to do as part of my PhD many years ago now was to create a task that mimics these different levels of threat imminence. So what we know behaviorally is in natural observations is that during the pre-encounter phase, you'll typically see the behaviors of freezing. OK, oh, sorry, I should say intermittent locomotion and cautious behaviors. OK, um, this is where you'll get this sort of um, voluntary freezing where the, um, the, the, for example, if it's a rodent, will go along, stay still, move its eye dart, look around the environment and then move again. It's minimizing its, its movement um, to protect itself against any potential threats that are monitoring them or may detect them. During post encounter phase, we see freezing behavior. And then during circus strike phase, we typically see escape responses. And if the threat comes too close and there's no way to escape, you'll see, particularly in rodents, fight responses. Now, there's clearly species-specific differences um, in, these, um, in these responses. Um, and uh, this has really led us to go into this field of computational neuroethology, where we actually have a paper under review at the moment, where, where what we're trying to do is create these two-dimensional environments. We can measure things like escape behavior, um, and uh, intermittent locomotion pauses and so on in these different virtual environments, which I won't talk about too much today, uh, but you can ask me any questions about that at the end. Okay, so here's a paper that we published uh, last year, about a year ago now, and we kind of took uh, Fanzo's model and tried to map onto that um, these different um, fear and anxiety states, okay? And what we proposed is that when we're under circus strike attack, when the threat is very close, you'll get this uncoordinated flight, this panic type response, okay? Under those conditions, you don't really wanna be thinking, you just wanna be reacting, 
Okay, but if the threat is more distant, you will see what we call reactive fear. This is where you see some coordination between fight, flight, and freezing behavior. And if the threat is even further away but attacking, you'll go into this cognitive fear system where you begin to strategize, well, should I go left, should I go right? Where's the closest safety exit, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the way that we define fear, again, is within this um, circus strike context. You're under attack, the threat is here and now, okay? Now you get this sort of transition zone between the post encounter threat, okay? Where you'll get some elements of this cognitive fear system, okay? And I'll come back to that later when I talk about one of our ex experiments on, on, uh, uh, on, on anxiety. During the post encounter, the threat is present, but it's not attacking you. You will get this encounter anxiety. So you're freezing and the threat is somewhere in the distance um, and uh, you become anxious, but you have these, this recognition of your own feeling states, for example, you'll freeze, but you have more of a uh, ability to be able to make predictions about what the threat will do, make predictions about what you think is the best escape route, for example, appraise the, uh, the, the threat. Will it attack me or won't it attack me, for example? Hey, Dean, can I interrupt yeah. you for just a minute? Um, yeah, sure. There's some requests if you can use a mouse over and hover over the screen so people can see what which one you're talking about since oh, so some I, figures I, are complex, yeah. if you can. Yeah. yeah, so I'm down there on B. So post-encounter um, threat here is this encounter uh, uh, anxiety, okay, that I just mentioned. If we go over to the pre-encounter, there's no threat in the environment, okay, but there's the potential for a threat in the environment. We have this anticipatory anxiety okay and finally um when we're safe we can just think about threats in the future we can think about the big talk that we have to give in in a year's time for example um we can begin to then ruminate about that but this is more intermittent uh, anxiety it's not overwhelming you with anxiety every now and again you'll feel some uh, anxiety when you start to think about this potential threat in the future now i'm not saying that these are continuously uh, these are these are uh, distinct categories, I believe that there's a continuum. And what I'm going to talk about is really as the threat becomes closer, you're going to switch from these cortical systems that are associated with anxiety, the hippocampus, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, extended to regions such as the insula as well. And we're going to do a switch and show how this is going to go from the cortex into the midbrain regions where they're associated reactive behaviors such as fight and flight, including regions such as the paraconductal gray. Okay, so I'll use the pointer next time. Thank you. So um, um, what we propose then in an article is that, um, is that really, particularly in humans, this may also account for to other species as well, is that there's really five strategies that we use uh, to survive predatory threat, okay? Uh, we have a prediction strategy, a protection or prevention strategy, a threat oriented strategy, threat assessment strategies and reactive defensive strategies. And if we take them, we put them all together in a sort of box model like this, is that what we can see over here on the left is Fanslow's um, levels of threat imminence going from safety pre-encounter, no threat potential, but a potential threat, a threat but not attacking in the post-encounter and circus strike, the threat is attacking you. And what we believe is that there's a set of strategies that uh, humans and potentially other animals will use to reduce the likelihood that they'll fall down this scale. Most uh, uh, organisms want to stay round about here. They want to be in a pre-encounter or safe condition. They want to do everything they can to avoid the encounter with a predator. So what we have is these prediction strategies, the ability to simulate, imagine, okay, and passively avoid potential threats that we may encounter in the future. And one way to do this is through prevention strategies. So if I can make the prediction I'm going to encounter a threat in the future, I could do something about it. OK, I can change the environment through niche construction or niche construction, as they say in America. Um, and this is where I can build a wall, OK, to keep threats away from me or I can uh, I can live in a group. OK, I won't go out at night alone. I'll, I'll go out with a group of other people to protect myself. These are prevention strategies. OK, but as we switch over into the post encounter, a stimulus appears, it captures our attention. And this is what we call threat oriented strategies. OK, and this will result in in freezing type behaviors I mentioned before. And if we have no prediction about that threat, we have this backup system, this, this bottom up attention system. We get a prediction error. OK, but we may have predictions about, about the fact that in that environment, we've seen a predator come from that 
left side where the bushes are, for example. So we may have a prediction about where we might see that threat in the environment, and that's via our top-down attention systems. And we might then decide that, well, that's not a threat in the environment, or we might have to go into uh, uh, deeper processing. So again, I'm gonna be using my mouse, there we go. So we can either ignore that stimulus in the environment, it's not a threat, or we can go into deeper processing into what we call threat assessment strategy. This is where we um, determine the value of that threat. Should I be scared or not? We track its movements. We make predictions about where its movements will be, um, it, uh, about the actions that that threat will make. We search for safety. And this has been a big part of our more recent research on uh, safety seeking. And we determine what's the best action to take. And, um, and, and we can also simulate what the best action will be. OK, for our imagination systems. And this can result in freezing, but also direct to the escape. The, um, the, um, the safety exit is to the right. So I'm going to move to the right to, to get to safety. OK, again, this is a very slow process. This involves hippocampal prefrontal systems. And I'll talk a bit about, more about this later. However, once the danger threshold is breached, the threat sees you, begins to attack. You switch over into these more reactive defensive systems, such as uh, uh, flight and, and fight responses. You prepare for contact with the uh, with the threat. Um, you increase your analgesic responses, um, and if the threat comes too close, you get this panic type indirect escape. Okay. So again, leading to this idea that what we can go from is these prediction uh, and prevention strategies that will evoke low levels of anxiety all the way down into these fear defensive circuits that are more reactive. Now, feeding into these circuits is a, um, is a modulatory system where we can reappraise and cognitively control with varying degrees of success, okay? So we can try and suppress, for example, um, our, uh, uh, intermittent anxiety associated with, uh, with potential encounters with future threats. We can do that through uh, cognitive control systems, work of James Gross and uh, former colleague uh, Kevin Oxen has done a lot of work uh, related to that. But also we have a set of learning systems that are continuously updating all of these strategies. Okay, and I want to focus on really two here, which is the encounter anxiety, which is where we encounter a threat and we learn from encountering that threat, and vicarious learning, where we can learn via watching the news or storytelling or our friends tell us that don't go to that part of town, it's dangerous. And what I'm going to really focus on here um, in this model is really two things I think are very different. Um, in humans, that's this ability to be able to imagine future threats that we've not encountered yet, and the ability to learn from others about threats, okay? Um, these are two of the most optimal survival strategies that any organism can have, because if I can make predictions and I can learn vicariously, I never actually have to encounter that threat, okay? It's the most optimal avoidance strategy that any organism can have, but I think it gets us in trouble as well. We can imagine threats that are not really threats and we can learn about threats by, for example, watching um, the news um, or going on social media and learn about threats that are thousands of miles away, but they can still impact our um, ability to, to discern what is a threat and what isn't a threat. So I think this is why we may um, have increased anxiety in humans compared, potentially compared to other animals, because we have this ability to imagine and learn about threats that we've never actually encountered. Okay, so um, what we've decided to do in our research then is try and look at how we can um, move through these different levels of, of uh, threat imminence and these defensive circuits in humans. Now I want to take a little bit of a step back here because if you go onto Neurosynth and you type in there anxiety and the word fear, the first thing that you're going to see here is that there's a somewhat a significant overlap between these two different emotions. And really the focus in a lot of these emotions has been centered around tasks that evoke the amygdala. This is not saying that the, uh, the amygdala is not important to both of these emotions. It is distinct parts of the amygdala particularly. Um, but what it doesn't really do is dissociate these two emotions, okay? And if we go back to the models that I talked about, Fanzo's model and these models um, uh, associated with different um, ecological conditions that give rise to different defensive responses that mimic anxiety and fear, we would expect there would be different neural circuits in the brain. As I mentioned, these more cortical, hippocampal uh, regions of the brain associated with potential anxiety versus midbrain PAG regions 
um, and thalamic or thalamic regions associated with fear response. We don't see this when we look at neurosynth. And this is really because the way that we've defined fear and anxiety overlaps and the types of paradigms that we've used have been limited, okay? A lot of the time what you will see is that people will use faces to, to, to really describe that as, a, as fear, really it's perception of a fearful stimulus. And in some sense, when you see a face that's fearful, it's a capturing your attention, but it's also potentially signaling anxiety systems as well, that there's a potential to encounter a threatening environment. But it's not a direct threat itself. You could argue that an angry face is maybe more relevant to a direct fear response. So um, in a, a paper we, uh, I briefly mentioned earlier, which we published last year, we proposed that there's this set of defensive circuits that are really organized across a set of population codes that extend from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and and particularly the ventral hippocampus. And I'll come back to that when we talk about some of our research in a minute. And then oh, there's these more modulatory systems that go from the amygdala, Bernoulli's stri terminalis associated with more with more sustained threat and anxiety, it's worked by uh, Davis and others, all the way down to these reactive systems in the midbrain paraconductive gray. Those of you who don't know the midbrain paraconductive gray, it's a region that we know that you can stimulate different columns within the rodent brain and evoke different defensive responses. If you stimulate the uh, dorsal parts of the PAG, you will evoke more active coping or fight or flight responses. Ventral re lateral regions of the PAG will evoke more passive coping such as freezing responses, okay? And we know through the work of my colleague at Caltech that there's um, a modulation of these midbrain regions, which we're working on now, um, by the uh, hypothalamus as well. But what we see is that it's not really that all of these regions switch off, okay? It's, it's at some level, these population codes um, work together to create this unified um, uh, defensive response. You'll keep seeing, particularly when the threat's uh, attacking, this switch between cortical and midbrain regions. So it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, it means that there's, um, there's these populations that at some level are all active, but the system works as an old. And again, this sort of links a little bit in some respects to um, um, conceptual act theory um, by uh, Fellman Barrett. So how does threat transfer along these defensive circuits? That was really our first question. Um, and what I want to show you now is a video um, giving you an example of these different um, uh, defensive um, uh, responses as a function of the different mode of danger. So I'll talk to you through this as we go through. It is a tiger, this is in India. And what you'll see is um, tourists um, on the top uh, or on the back of an elephant, okay? So this guy here is in the post-encounter phase because he knows, he can't see it, but he knows that there's a threat in this grass here, a tiger, okay? And they're filming this, he knows it's there. So they're all anxious, waiting to see if the tiger will appear. And here it appears. Now we're switched over to the circus strike. Okay. Now, um, the, I should say that the, the individual was okay. Um, he, he didn't die or anything. I heard he lost a couple of fingers, um, but uh, 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 he, he was okay in the end. So um, what we're interested then in this, in this first experiment um, was to look at what happens in the brain when the threat is distant to, to moving uh, closer to the individual is always more um, distal versus proximal. So I'll give you the example of the post encounter. We know there's a threat, but there's no attack. Um, but um, what we're interested in this first uh, experiment is that what's happening in the brain of this individual when the threat's here, and it's getting closer, getting closer and closer. Now we're not interested in the contact itself, okay? The pain itself. We, we control for that in this experiment and on the other experiments I'll be talking about. We're just interested in what's different when the threat is distant versus close. And the vicarious learning rule there is a stick is not a great weapon against a tiger. Okay, so we did a very simple task um, uh, 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 during my PhD where we did a Pac-Man type game. So you want to think about Pac-Man when you think about this task. And what happened is the subjects are in this two-dimensional maze and they're being pursued by this red dot. Okay, so they're moving their um, triangle just here, okay, around the two-dimensional maze, very much like Pac-Man. And this threat um, this red dot is coming closer or further away from them, okay? If it captures them, it will give them an electric shock to the back of the end. We're not interested in the electric shock here. We're just interested in when the threat is closer or further away. So what did we find? We found that when we examined the brain activity parametrically, that the threat was further and further away, 
we found there was increased activity in this ventral medial prefrontal region just here, which you can see at the top here in purple. However, as the threat came closer, we saw a switch to this midbrain region associated with the midbrain region of the paraconductal gray. Okay, so here the threat is not captured, it's just the difference between when the threat's close and when the threat is further away. Okay, so to prove that concept, we also showed that because we did high resolution imaging on this, this study, 1.5 millimeter at the time, you can go much uh, higher resolution now, but at that time we used 1.5 millimeter. And we're able to show that there was differences in the amygdala, that when the threat was close, there was increased activity in regions in the dorsal amygdala, which correspond with the central nucleus, and the lateral amygdala when the threat was distant, which was associated with the basal um, uh, lateral parts of the amygdala, which we also predicted. But we didn't talk too much about in the paper because at that time, nobody had really dissociated the amygdala. They didn't really believe with brain imaging that you could dissociate. Now there's loads of studies showing that you can. So this was our first proof of concept. We used this active escape task where subjects had to avoid the threat and looked at proximal and distal threat. We next wanted to um, examine this with much more of an ecologically sort of valid stimuli. Um, and we didn't really want to use um, shocks um, in this experiment. We want to use some sort of intrinsic threat stimulus. So we used a tarantula using a behavioral approach task. So what we did was we placed um, individuals into an MRI scanner. Um, this is a schematic, schematic of the, of the MRI scanner. And on the front of the scanner is a camera, okay? And they can look down at this open top box here and see me move this tarantula in and out these different positions of the, of the, um, of the box, okay? Here's an actual subject here, or pilot subject, where you can see the, um, the camera here and they're looking down. And they think that they can see me moving this tarantula in that in the box. I convinced them that I was doing that. We actually, um, uh, we started off um, showing them uh, the box where the tarantula was, and then um, we um, moved a fake tarantula in out of these different positions of the box and swapped out for videos to show the real um, tarantula. And we, we lost a few people at the beginning because it didn't look that believable. But once we got it making look really, believe it, really believable, we had 20 subjects who believed that I was moving this tarantula in and out of this um, open top box towards their foot. And then she could see the top of the box is covered. So, um, and we gave them various excuses for that. We also um, put a curtain just here, which you can't see in the schematic. So they couldn't keep looking down, okay? All they could see is on the screen above their head, the um, tarantula moving closer or further away from their foot. Good thing about this experiment is that we could decorrelate space and time. So we decorrelated the, um, the positions of the tarantula that would be closed and it would be box three and then box four and box, five, for example, and so forth, okay? So this was our experiment. And what we were interested in here then is that what happens in the brain as the tarantula is placed closer to the subject's foot, okay? So um, we looked here parametrically at the activity as the threat, um, as the neural activity ramped up as a function of when the tarantula was placed close to their foot. We didn't do high resolution imaging here, um, but what we did find was that um, regions of the midbrain, this pig actually in the paraconductor gray, but we were, because we did not do high resolution imagery, we focused on it, um, calling this really the midbrain for any controversial reasons. But again, we see these midbrain regions coming online as the tarantulas move close to their foot. Um, similar to before, slightly different uh, region, but what we found is that when the threat is moved away from the subject's foot, there's increased activity in this region of the orbital medial prefrontal cortex. Now, this was very interesting because we know this is a region um, that seems to respond to, um, to, uh, to therapy in spider phobics. So there's one study that showed that when individuals come in and we show them pictures, or they show them pictures of the uh, tarantula, you'll get this threat circuitry coming online. Then they have um, a few weeks of, um, of therapy or extinction therapy with these um, spiders bring them back into the scanner. And the one region that predicts the reduced um, fear um, associated with um, the tarantula is this region in orbital prefrontal cortex. And, and we've conducted a number of studies now suggesting this may um, elicit some form of a safety signal, okay? And this is a paper that we, um, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute um, briefly to show that there's a bunch of studies now showing this posterior and anterior parts of the prefrontal cortex associated with, with safety and threat signals in the prefrontal cortex. 
what's also nice about these um these um um sorts of time okay i'm going over a bit um is is that um you can reorganize the conditions to look at um different parts of this threat circuitry so what we did here was we looked at um the keeping the tarantula in one position here but we um, looked at how the subjects monitored the movements of the threat. So did this chancellor move closer to them or did it move away from them? Okay. And um, we kept the uh, spatial position the same. I'm giving you a simple version of this here. Um, we looked at this box here as well and, and uh, this box here as well. But what we want to look at is how they're monitoring the history of the movements of the tarantula. And this is where we found the bed nucleus astride terminalis coming online. If the threat was moving towards them from a previous position, we found not only dorsal parts of the amygdala, but also the bilateral bed nucleus astride terminalis, a region that we know is associated with anxiety, but also with a sustained threat. So what we've shown here is there's some forms of this parallel set of processes going on associated with the space and time to the threat, the history of the threat's movements. And what I didn't talk about was um, the, what we call the expectancy errors, the predictions. Um, and what we found is that when the threat or the spider, for example, was scarier than what they predicted, we found that this activated the amygdala, okay? What about decisions? Um, so more recently, we've moved back over to inspiration from the field of behavioral ecology. And um, we've used this uh, idea from the field of behavioral ecology known as flight, not known as flight initiation distance. And um, we were very much inspired by this um, theoretical paper by Yellenberg and Dill called The Economics of Fleeing from Predators. Um, this wasn't the first paper to talk about flight initiation distance, but it was certainly the one that made the concept um, famous. And what is flight initiation distance? The distance at which prey will flee from an approaching threat. So when an animal um, is um, surviving on a daily basis it's, and it encounters a predator, it's making really two decisions. It's making the decision about other survival behaviors such as mating and foraging as well as being safe. And what flight initiation distance proposes is that when the, for example, we've got a zebra here, when it sees a lion, if it's foraging, it will continue to forage if it's, if it's hungry, but there'll become a certain point in which it will move back to the safety of its group, okay? And that's captured here. Um, what there is is a decision, which is the cost of not fleeing here in blue. If it doesn't flee, it's more likely to get caught by the predator, but the cost of fleeing is it's gonna give up some other survival behavior, such as um, mating, and as I mentioned, uh, consumption of food. This is a very simple model, there's more complex models than this. And what we propose is that when the uh, individual is making a fast um, escape response, this will activate what we refer to more as these reactive fear circuits that I mentioned earlier, which we define as a quick phase of coordinated reaction to response, of an imminent threat that is perceived to be or directed towards the organism and when there is little time to cognitively comprehend the danger of the situation versus cognitive fear again you're still under attack but you're given more time now the decision space increases okay when the threat is more distant um, and here you get more of a conscious feeling of terror and horror which results from the presence of the threat that is or perceived to be directed towards the organism where there is not only time to strategize the escape but comprehend the forbidden nature of the situation. So now what we're going from is these midbrain regions I mentioned earlier, midbrain brain to gray area, where we just simply want to react to these cortical systems on how we can strategize and use our memory systems and prospection systems to avoid that threat. So we create a very simple task here. And this was with Song Chi. Um, and um, what individuals uh, encountered was either a fast attacking threat or a slow attacking threat. Okay, which we believe would activate the fear circuits in the um, fast attacking threat or the um, reactive fear circuits and the cognitive and stroke anxiety fear circuits when the threat is slow. So the subjects um, uh, control this little triangle just there. Okay, and what will happen is one of these dots will oscillate towards them. Okay, and the subject um, has to press a button to go back to the safety exit, okay? And we're interested in this decision phase just there. Now, the incentive here to stay in this position is that the longer they stay there, the more money they earn, okay? So the subject then will encounter this one with the attack early, which is a fast attacking threat or attack late, okay? Which is the slow attacking threat. 
If the subject's caught, they will lose the money and receive an electric shock. Oh, screen froze. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what did we find on this task? We found that when they're making a faster decision, okay, it's around about four seconds when they're making this, um, this decision. So it's still quite slow, but um, fast in the context of when this, uh, uh, in the context of the experiment. And what we found is that compared to matched uh, control conditions, which we can see here on the, on the left of the bar, we find that the midbrain parameter to gray came online more when they're um, escaping the fast attacking threat, as did the mid cingulate region, which we interpreted as more of these sort of motor uh, responses uh, that we know uh, have strong connections with the midbrain pipeductor gray here as well, as well as other regions such as the, the insula. So what we find is that when you're making a faster decision, you get the uh, PAG and the mid cingulate region. But when you're making a slower decision, again, we're comparing this to um, the, the, the um, fast decision, but also the control conditions as well, a match for any temporal confines in this experiment. What we find is that the prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate, and parts of the hippocampus come along when they're given more time to make those decisions. Okay. And what we're looking at here is two seconds before they make their decision, I should say. So we control for the, temp the timing there as well in terms of the, the decision time. So what we, we had shown then is that these prefrontal regions and hippocampal regions associated with, with, with coming online when you're given more time to strategize the escape, drawing probably on these memory systems to make perspective decisions. But when you're given less time, you don't wanna be thinking too much. You wanna be just reacting to these threats um, and, um, and uh, you will activate more of these regions of the, uh, of the, of the midbrain PAG. So, our argument next one then, then was that we're looking at, in that experiment, we refer to these as cognitive fearsomes, but we expect them to overlap with these anxiety circuits. Again, if you remember, we talk about these as a continuum, okay? So the argument is, is that what we should find is that trait anxiety differences should only correlate with the cognitive fear systems because to become anxious, you need time to think, okay? However, um, when you're making a faster decision where you don't want to be thinking too much, trait anxiety should not correlate with these faster reactive systems. So what do we find behaviorally? Well, this is what we find. It, we find that um, individuals who score higher on tray anxiety flee earlier from the slow attacking threat, okay? And we did various other controls. I'm just showing you the, the, um, the basic version of our correlations here, and you can see more details in the paper we published um, a couple of years ago now. However, um, when they're making a faster decision, Okay, we found that there was no correlation with tray anxiety. Okay, and this supports our idea that that you need time to be able to um, become anxious. I know Dan Pine and others, um, um, uh, Andrew Matthews, others have this theory that if you take an high anxious individual and a slow uh, uh, and, and a low anxious individual, push them in front of danger, they're both going to react the same. Okay, you need time to think to become anxious. So what do we find in the brain? We find that Nothing in the brain correlates with the fast attacking threat, even when we control for all the variance differences and so forth. But what we do find is that um, the uh, ventral hippocampus, insula, and ventral medial prefrontal cortex correlate with increasing uh, trait anxiety. And we found that when we ran um, uh, PPI to look at the coupling between these brain regions based on their time series, we found that the strength of the coupling between these regions uh, was associated with increased trait anxiety. And this is really nice because it fit beautifully with the animal work from Josh uh, Gordon's group. Again, we find nothing for the fast attacking threat, which seems to activate more of this purely fear circuitry in the midbrain uh, and motor circuits. Okay, I'm not gonna have too much time to go through this. So I'll, I'll go through this um, very quickly, um, but we wanted to um, tap into these um, these hippocampal and prefrontal systems um, using another task on what we call perspective avoidance or margin of safety task. What is margin of safety? What you find is that when, a th when prey are in a high dense predator environment or a volatile uncertain environment, they would typically forage closer to their safety refuge. However, when they're in it, sorry? Sorry, Dean. Um, we, we announce it as it goes on until 1.30, which is 10.30 your time. So we okay. have, 
including Q and A. Some people might not be able to stay, but just so you know, you you do have time right. at least with an announcement. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I was just going through it there as fast as I could. <laughs> All right. I'll slow down a bit now. And um, sorry for those of you who won't see it, but they're recording this, so you can see the end of it if you can't stay online. So when you're um, you can make you can predict encounters with predators in the environment, low dense, more certain environments, more predictable environments, the prey will move further away from its magic, from its safety refuge, which we refer to as the margin of safety. And this is work from the field of behavioral ecology. So we create a very uh, simple task again, where subjects are given a contingency of eye reward, eye shocks, low shocks, eye reward, the various permutations. And then they would encounter three different um, virtual attacking predators, okay? Um, if we move over to here on the right, before I describe the experiment, um, these colors um, indicate what type of um, attack distribution these different spheres are. So for example, if we go over here to the blue, we can see that this is just a normal distribution, okay? If we go to the green, this is a normal distribution, but with double the variance, okay, compared to the blue. And this has match variance to the one of interest for us, which is a leptokurtic um, distribution. And, this, and what leptokurtic distributions basically show is that there's more outliers, okay? Therefore, it's more uh, difficult to predict when a threat in, the, in this context will attack. Okay, and I'll come back to that if that's not clear in a minute. So they're shown, uh, for example, the red one, the leptokurtic one. They're asked about how confident they are of escaping that threat short uh, uh, interval, and then they're asked to make a decision about how close they want to place their, their triangle here to safety, okay? Now, what we're using here is multivariate pattern analysis. We want to control for as much as possible here, okay? So they see this screen where they, um, it's actually um, less complex than what you see here, but we're trying to control for um, uh, uh, all the aspects of any visual differences in this, this task, any motor differences. They're asked to make the decision, and that they're given four seconds, and that's the four seconds that we're interested in. And then they're given three seconds to execute that motor uh, 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 decision. So first uh, four seconds, they can't move the triangle, and then they're moving closer or further away to this, um, to this safety exit, okay? They'll then see the outcome of the flight initiation distance, okay, where they'll see where the threat attacked them. So they're beginning to build a model of the attack distributions of these three different um, uh, uh, types of, of virtual predators, okay? And over time they're learning this um, and they're beginning to learn over time that it's easier to predict these two than it is to predict this one, the red one I should say. So what do we see? Um, if we look at just purely the distributions of when they fled by the position of the um, virtual predator, it's a bit difficult to see from these um, um, histograms here, but if we go over here, we can see that um, actually this is the confidence. I should say I'll show you on the next slide the, um, the the actual boxes like this. But what we can see, if we can um, look closer, um, sorry, I should have put the other image in there. That's my fault. Um, what we can see is that they would move themselves closer to the safety exit if they're encountering the more uncertain one than they were if they were encountering the more predictable ones using just normal Gaussian distributions. And we can see their confidence of escape was lower for the leptokurtic um, uh, distribution than the two normal distributions. I should actually say that we never found any differences between these two um, behaviorally. I should say I took this uh, out, the, I should have left it in, but what we also showed that, that, um, that um, on our sample of 23, it's a very low end, um, but what we found is that um, it was only for this leptokurtic uncertain one did we find a correlation between trait anxiety and margin of safety decisions. Although I would like to run this on a much larger sample to see if those, if all of those correlations become significant with a larger population. Okay, what do we see in the brain? So here we're using the multivariate pattern analysis, okay, um, using the support vector machine, uh, leave one out uh, method. And what we're interested in is what they, um, uh, is basically their MOS choice. Now we're not making any distinctions about whether they made a safe, a safe or a dangerous choice. We're just interested in their decision um, during um, this um, uh, decision phase of the margin of safety choice, okay? And we wanna see how that uh, uh, is classified in the brain, okay? So we use a classification search slide here. 
And what do we find? We found these same regions that we predicted associated with this cognitive fear, the hippocampus, but also regions of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Now, um, this was very interesting because we'd, we'd made these predictions that what we would expect is that these anterior regions of the, of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex would be associated with making a safe decision versus a more um, threatening decision or less risky decision would be associated with activating these regions of the, of the um, posterior ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So of course, we couldn't say that based upon the, on, on this analysis here because we're just purely looking at their choice per se. Okay. But if we, um, if we uh, run uh, regions of interest within these, these areas, what we see is that um, hippocampus doesn't care whether, it's, whether you can predict it or not. It seems to be above threshold, significantly above threshold for all three of these different distributions. But when um, they're encountering the purely um, uh, um, uh, more unpredictable threat of the leptocurtic attacking threat, we find that if we run an ROI in this region here, okay, we see that this is the only region that's above threshold in our classification. However, if we look at this anterior region, we see that it's the, the most predictable of the three, okay, is the one that's above threshold, okay? So what we're seeing here then is that for the more predictable um, attacking threat, more regions of the anterior ventral medial prefrontal common line, versus for the less predictable, more posterior. So we want to probe this more by using a univariate analysis. Um, but um, I should point you out to this paper that we're, um, uh, we, we um, have under minor revisions at the moment, where we ran a meta-analysis um, of the peaks of all the studies that look at threat signals in the prefrontal cortex in humans and safety signals, okay? And what we found is this dissociation. Safety signals seem to be more anterior than threat signals in the um, prefrontal cortex. And we expect this to, you actually can see this now, there's a preprint online if you're interested in this um, paper, you can go to my website um, or um, uh, go to the psych archive. Um, and um, uh, we're anticipating this, hopefully will get accepted um, sometime in the near future. So what we did then is we went back to the uh, univariate analysis and we ran um, uh, a PPI to look at the coupling between brain regions, okay? What we can see here is that Borman area 10, particularly this Borman area 10 R and P, we see that seems to be associated with um, this more anterior region versus regions such as the subgenual um, uh, ACC and posterior parts of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior, see? But we refer to these as the uh, anterior and posterior. So what do we find? We find that if you run a PPI on the seed of the posterior, there's a, a significant um, a, a coupling with the hippocampus and the amygdala. But if we run a seed uh, or plant a seed here in the anterior peak based off of the, um, uh, the uh, MVPA analysis peaks, what we find is this, this um, couples with a different area of, of the brain, mainly the striatum and the chordae. And we can see here also um, the regions that, it, um, that also uh, correspond with the seed. And you can see all three of these areas for this posterior seed seem to be associated with the frontal pole. We next wanted to run a parametric analysis to look at what happens when they place themselves clo uh, closer to safety or move towards danger. Okay, so when they're moving themselves um, closer to danger, um, so the parametric analysis here is when they're moving themselves either closer to danger or further away. I mean, using that distance as a parametric modulator, we see that there is increased posterior parts of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And as they move themselves close to safety, it switches to the anterior regions of the, of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So we have a kind of relating behavior to neural signal. And uh, we come up with sort of a preliminary sort of model here where when it's a predictable threat, this will be associated with this, this different stream of activity in this striatum. And when it's more unpredictable, the posterior will activate more the amygdala and hippocampal circus. And what I didn't talk about is we run a simple RL um, computational model here and we found that it was actually in the striatum and the um, amygdala hippocampus for these two different types of threat that also activated for um, prediction errors as well. 
Okay, so the summary is that fear and anxiety are a dynamic process involved in a complex set of defensive circuits. Distal or slowly gradual attacking threat evokes this cognitive um, and anxiety uh, circuitry um, involved in, uh, uh, which includes, I should say, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate, hippocampus, and parts of the amygdala, particularly the lateral parts. Proximal or fast attacking threats activate uh, these reactive fear circuits of the midbrain and motor circuits. We see, uh, as we just saw in this last task, that avoidance decisions um, involve these neural circuits associated with perspective and anxiety, the same as we just mentioned in this distal and slowly gradual attacking throughout the hippocampus and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And this may relate to some form of the eye order representations of fear um, that we also see in regions of the frontal part. Uh, again, I want to thank all these individuals and my lab for um, doing all of uh, uh, this work and and um, and uh, doing all the ad work these days in some respects. Uh, I'll just get to sit here and give these wonderful talks to you guys. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't unmute, so please unmute yourself if you can and give a round of applause to the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, there's a couple of questions and I'll start with Eitan's questions. Um, Let's see, the first one is in the spider experiment, was there a difference between the first exposure and following exposures to the manipulation that is with experience? I don't know if you can see it in the chat box, Dean. Basically what I'm saying is on the first trial or two trials, it's unpredictable. They're not sure about the task, but after a while they get to learn the task. So it's, I think you followed it up later on with your different situations. You have to un unmute if you want to talk. Sorry about that. Um, I'm usually watching these, so I'm forgetting where the mute button is. Um, so yes, we do see that. We see that over time, there's a decrease sort of activity, a sort of habituation that goes on um, from the first part of the experiment to the last part of the experiment. They become less fearful. Of course, that's going to happen. But I think what's interesting about it is it really talks about this dynamic nature of these different uh, defensive circuits, not one stable circuit that, that uh, I've often thought about this in terms of how do we measure these things in some respects when we get the threat signals, we're really getting it at the beginning when there's more uncertainty and towards the end they're learning strategies or, um, or they're learning that it's no longer the threat that they originally thought it was going to be. It's something that we, we, we try and model in these experiments, but it's not easy. And we don't really know those temporal dynamics a lot of the time. I think I can see Louise there, but Louise has probably looked at this a bit more than me as well. Hey. <laughs> Great. Uh, Etan, did you want to ask your second question about the ventral hippocampus? Sure, <laughs> I may as well. So you mentioned ventral hippocampus. I wasn't sure what you were talking about. I yeah. know in rodents, it, there's a ventral dorsal, but in humans, I, I know about the anterior posterior. So if you could just maybe expand. Yeah, yeah. That. We refer to more as the anterior um, when, when we're, we're talking about that region. And we kind of stuck with that terminology a bit more because of the work. Um, we try to keep it consistent with the animal work. Um, but you know what, I mean, there's work out there that has made distinctions between these, the, the, these two regions using IAPS pictures and so on. Um, there's very little work out there really separating them. Um, and we didn't do a anterior posterior separation, you know, so, Maybe that's something we could do in the future where we could actually compare the two to show that there is a significant different, difference. Thank we you. use more to keep consistently with the terminology. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? It's like Louise, you have something? Yeah, I was just gonna follow Great. up when we do when we do ROIs uh, uh, somewhat arbitrarily with the cutoff point anterior posteriorly with in humans, of course, we do see quite a bit of a difference. So we, we've been doing, instead of more of a voxel-wise type of analysis, we've been focusing more on, on regions of interest and and trying to define them based on, on some prior literature. We, we, we do find um, quite a bit of a, uh, uh, the kinds of findings that that uh, people have discussed in, in the talk today, obviously, uh, really in, in the in the anterior part, um, much more so, and and we see these uh, threat related. Well, 
yeah, we have we have paradigms that we we also look at more sustained with sustained anxiety as opposed to more the the type of um, paradigm that Dean investigates, and we see a lot of engagement of of the anterior hippocampus. Yeah, I think um, you know, I think what we've really focused on is more on developing the paradigms to be able to dissociate these midbrain cortical regions, and we're continuing to do that. Um, uh, we don't really have the ability to do high resolution imaging, you know, below one millimeter to be able to really dissociate these. We have access to the 7T scanner, but of course it becomes a lot of problems when you use these scanners, particularly when they give shocks and so forth. So it's something that we want to pursue. We want to make sure that we can control for a lot of the confounds um, using these, you know, higher field um, scanners and so on and, and, um, uh, and so forth. Great. Any other questions? I have other questions if other people don't, but I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait for uh, other people to have a, a, a turn before I. I think I think you're good to go, Louise. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I was. I was. I mean, it's fantastic talk. By the way, is is, is really um, beautiful work you've been doing for for now for for a long time. Yeah. And uh, so we also are seeing a lot of that posterior cingulate, uh, cuneus, I mean, precuneus, and, and, and other kinds of um, uh, this unexpected type of involvement that, that I think more and more people are seeing. And I, I was paying attention to, to your talk and, and you're, you're emphasizing the, the interior parts of, of the medial prefrontal cortex and quite heavily and it makes a lot of sense, obviously, we know a lot about them and can relate that to a lot of things. But I, I'm, I'm, so I'm very puzzled about the posterior part myself. So I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts? And, and, and we keep on seeing like your, your work and other people's work, it, it, it's a large part of the brain, obviously. And so it keeps on shifting depending on the paradigm, but it seems to be kind of pretty robust in each one of them. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't have a good sense of really what's happening there. Uh, uh, that makes two of us. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, I tend to think about it as sort of more of this episodic memory perspection system. You know, um, uh, there's obviously theories about, you know, self and of course, of course, resting state theories as well um, associated. And I think it's a very interesting um, uh, topic to really go into. I mean, some t I, I always just think about, you know, when they did the phase processing and everyone was so focused upon the FFA and then everybody keeps saying, but there's this posterior region in the OF, you know, the orbital face area and then all of a sudden the orbital face area became popular. Maybe we're missing something, you know. Um, but the way I think about it is we, you know, pr you know, pr premature see it for the slow um, uh, uh, type tasks, you know, where you're, where the, the gradual tarantula coming closer, you're given more time to think. And we think about this more is that when you're given more time to think, your decision space increases, you're relying on previous memories and episodic memories and so forth. And you're using that information to determine um, how scared you should be or the strategy that you, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the strategy that you're going to use based off of your previous experience. But we've not really gone into, into it that, that deep. And I think that for us, when we did the original sort of um, experiment um, where the active escape task, um, we had a lot of questions that came out of that, um, that we wanted to say, well, you know, if we change, because the, if, we, if we change it from spatial to more temporal threats, do we still see these same circuits coming online? Um, and, or if we see it with a, with a intrinsically, um, intrinsically like a tarantula, um, where there's no actual outcome of a shock, just the anticipation that you may get bitten by it, um, then do we still see the same areas? And we, we pretty much do. So that's really been the sort of goal for us. But I think the next step is to really go in and, and, and focus on these regions and see what they're doing. And I've not really thought about the experiments at this point in time in which we can do that. Um, but um, yeah, maybe yeah, talk to some episodic memory people and so, you know, so on, see if they can give us some ideas. Great, thank you. Any other questions? 
I see some comments that they loved your work, cool work, great talk, great talk. Um, so thank you very much. If there are no other questions, we will end today. And thanks, Jean, for the fantastic talk. It was great hearing from you. Yeah, thanks, for, right. me, thanks for inviting me in. Uh, I'll see you soon, Louise. I'll see you next year. <laughs>